Hello, and welcome to Subtext. The mainstream media triumphs the recovery of the economy, while millions of Americans find themselves set adrift by long-term unemployment. They've lost their work, their homes, their lives as they know it, while Washington lurches from one manufactured financial crisis to another. Discussion of how these, Amer how these Americans have come to be unemployed actually is moot. When we have, uh, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, a 6% chance of finding a job if you are over the age of 47. But what are you going to do when you find yourself jobless, homeless, and almost friendless? Because the emotional uh, ramifications of being uh, jobless for a significant period of time also takes its toll on everything in your life. Please join us tonight as we discuss being unemployed in America, because long-term unemployment is people. Coming up, we have a video about being out of work and over 50. We'll be right back after this video. So, Joe, why don't you just introduce yourself, say how old you are, say what your career has been, and the last day you worked in the mill. All right. My name is Joseph Price, the third, actually. I'm going to be 52 years old in uh, August, and I've been a steel worker for the past 25 plus years. My last day of work was two years ago, actually. I graduated high school in 1972. At that time, the economy was great. I had been in banking since I graduated from high school, uh, so I had a career of 31 years. That's basically what was instilled upon us, that you work 30 years in this mill, you're set for life. I loved my job, so when I lost my job, I lost my soul. My boss called me and said, I have to deliver really bad news. I feel so bad about this. I lost my job due to federal and state cutbacks. It was just, sorry, George. I've been unemployed now for one year and seven months. I've had literally maybe 10 interviews in two years. When I lost my job, I lost my health insurance. No, I don't have any health insurance, so I can't get sick or hurt. I have not paid a full mortgage payment since June of 2009. Now the house is uh, upside down significantly. The American dream to me has been erased as to what um, we thought it would be. guests who are here to talk about this really pressing um, topic in American uh, life today. With me today I have Kelly Coventry. Yeah, <laughs> Coventry. <laughs> I'm so it's bad okay. with names. Oh, don't I have Kelly um, and I also have with us we have Matt Grant and Kelly let's start with you. Looking at that video which mm -hmm. talked about long-term unemployment, um, please tell us what your experience is. Well I've been unemployed for about two years now. I just completed the process of going through applying for disability and finally just got right. it. Uh -huh. My husband and I became homeless and we, we've been out for just over two years. We're in the process of getting off the street uh -huh. and getting our lives back together. So what were the circumstances that led you to become unemployed? And first of all, who were you working for? Was it I was the... working for a small book dealer okay. in Harvard Square okay. and when the economy started going down a couple of years ago, so did the book market. Okay. With, with the boom of Kindle and Nook and all those electronic readers. Mm -hmm. That's what did it. Oh, wow. Okay. And so when you became unemployed, mm -hmm. were you, how, how did your employer handle it? Was it? It broke his heart. Oh, okay. And you went through your 99 weeks of unemployment? No. I, I, chose not to. I, w I wanted to go for the disability. Oh, you wanted to go for the disability. Okay. It, and was that because of 
the fact that you felt that you couldn't compete in the workforce or because... Yeah, I've, I've never been able to hold a job anyways. Okay. Every job I've had, I've been fired from or Oh, wow. Off. How come? A lot of different lot things. Of stuff. Yeah. Okay. A lot so, of little things that add up. And because of your unemployment, but also because of the disability issue, mm -hmm. you find yourself un, uh, out of work and basically homeless? Absolutely. And what was your experience, you know, just facing that? Scare, scary. Did you find social services in your community to be helpful? To an extent, not not a hundred percent. Nothing's ever perfect. Right, right, right. But social services were okay. They were okay. But did you find yourself in a shelter? Did you get? No, I refused to go into a shelter. So you got uh, friends helped you out, family? Yep, fr friends and okay, whatnot. Okay, thank you. And so, and so, Matt, you've also have experienced, although you're not unemployed at this moment, but you've right. also have faced this. Uh, yeah, back in um, 2009, um, once the financial crisis was kind of in full swing, the company I was laid off from a job that I'd had for about 12 years, mm -hmm. and um, so it, which came as kind of a shock. Um, I ended up being. It's funny, when you start talking about these things, I realize I don't actually know what the real definitions of certain things are. <laughs> like long so I was, it, it took me about, um, let's see, I want to say it was about 21 months or so before I got a full-time job right. again. Well, so, but I was freelancing and stuff like that. So again, when, people, when we talk about people being unemployed and long-term uh -huh. unemployment, I'm assuming though maybe falsely, that people are sometimes working or taking odd jobs and stuff right, like that, right. and that really to be employed right. means actually having a job and right. you're getting a W-2 and stuff. Well, we can actually go into the statistics. Okay. We, we have a couple of graphics coming up, but it is true sure. because um, you know, the way um, long-term unemployment is defined by the government is being unemployed for uh, more than 27 consecutive weeks. But they all weeks that is, wow. and they also. But there's also a statistic which we will find that talks about people taking jobs uh, part time because they couldn't right. find. Um, so we have those statistics, and let's talk about um, actually how you feel about these statistics. Some of them actually really shocked me. Right. So what is un the, the actual unemployment rate, and how is it calculated? Because yep. the truth of the matter is, is that I think everyone thinks that the government has this special formula for. Um, for uh, you know, finding out, and the truth of the matter is, it isn't what we think it is. So let's go to the next, the next graphic there. Okay, the U.S. Department of, Under, uh, of, of Labor on, on March 8th came out with their latest statistics, and we all know the good news is that 7.7% 7, 7 uh, unemployment, down from 7.9. Uh, 226,000 non-farm jobs were added in February. Employment increased, you know, professional and business services, construction and healthcare, but this does not account for job loss due to the national sequester, which is about to hit, and that is something that they are right. putting in their, their statistics. In the next slide, this is also breaks down, we all know about these, you know, the, the worker groups, and, you know, we see the, the basic things that the, uh, for, for whites, the unemployment rate is 6.8. We have blacks at 13.8, teenagers at 25.1, which is, if you think about it, is outrageous because, you know, teenagers usually get really, you know, low minimum wage jobs and right. so on and so forth, part-time jobs. Those are all gone. Hispanics at 9.6 and Asians at 6.1. Okay, going on. So long-term unemployment, as we were saying, is being class is classified as being out of work for 27 consecutive weeks or more. In February, the long-term unemployment rate was calculated at 4.8 million American workers. That's a lot of people, by the way. Now that in itself, it doesn't sound that bad, does it? But when you go closer, you go a little bit further into these statistics, we get some other things. So next slide, please. Okay, but what? But are these rates accurate? And this is what it's missing. The number of long-term unemployment people, unemployed people, grew from 4.8 million in February to 4.7 million in January. So there's growth there. You never heard that, and that's actually deep because while the short term is going down, the long term is going up. Of the people, they count. 
Right. The number of persons employed part-time for economic reasons is at 8.0 million. So what does that tell you? <laughs> I mean, that's also included in the long-term unemployment rates. Okay. And it was essentially unchanged in February. But, you know, if you think about it, once again, these are part-time jobs. These are part-time jobs that used to go right. to retirees and teenagers, and now you have the main uh, part of your workforce right. now, now, now using these uh, jobs as their main source of income. So next graphic. Okay, so we mo now, now let's break this down. So the workers that we just talked about, part-time employees and long-term unemployed, actually account for about 40% of the unemployed, which if you think about that, that's a pretty hefty part. The civilian force participation rate is about 63.5%, which changed now. Let's I'm talking about that civilian labor force right. participation. That's really where the number is. Because that 63.5% takes into account retirees, disabled, you know, this is just the workforce that could work, that is right. able able bodied. And only 63.5%. You know, and I guess for some countries that may be acceptable, but what does that tell you about the rest? And if you're looking at these government numbers, even these numbers suggest a discrepancy, especially when they will say, you know, you know, four million, and but they'll never tell you the percentage really, because that's where it gets muddy. Next slide, please. Okay, and here are alternate numbers. So if you look at this came from the Atlantic, and this is tracking by different means how long-term unemployment has played into uh, our economy since 19, what is that, 48, 48. I, 48. Now, it's interesting because in 1948 or thereabouts, they also changed their method mm -hmm. of uh, notating unemployment. It went from a more direct to a kind of convoluted. So, but you will not see these in government stats. This is coming from the Atlantic. This also was uh, published in uh, March 8th, 2013. Next slide, please. And PBS actually puts, if this is the, the Solomon scale, he's, he has a, he's on the news hour, and he actually, through his methodology, places, you know, regular unemployment at 16.46%. It's a lot different than, once again, 7.7. .7. So what do you think right. about any of this, Matt, so far? Well, first of all, it makes me feel like when people talk about unemployment or when the government talks about unemployment, obviously it's it's a political statement, you know, because this is a figure right. everyone kind of calculates our, like, economic health as a nation right, right. based on how many people are working. Or really, it's always, it's never about employment, it's always about unemployment. So right, exactly. It's like, what's the, you know, we think, well, there's all these people out of work. Now, of course, what they've been talking about for years now is the stuff that you're pointing out, that First of all, there's, it's a little weird. How do you calculate unemployment, mm -hmm. strictly speaking? And, I, and I've never, I'm not a statistician I never, or an economist, so I never really thought about it. But it's kind of when you showed that 63.5% of the people are in the workforce. So it's kind of weird. Yeah, where idea. are the rest of the so, people? <laughs> so suddenly it's like, all right, so because well, there's kids and stuff like that, we look at the population of the U.S., right? So not, you wouldn't have 100% unemployment. Never. I mean, 100% employment, employment. Right. Because what, they were little babies and stuff. Right, 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 right. So, and it, there's a huge percentage of population, I mean, it's more than half, as I understand, that's under 25. I mean, right. So the youth it always tends to be more than the older people. Right. So, so it, but it makes you start to wonder, it's like, well, so is real Im unemployment kind of what you were saying, 37%? Right. Or 36.5 or exactly. something like that? And, there's the other issue of people leaving the workforce. I right. guess that was especially during the last presidential campaign and even before, people kept talking about, well, real unemployment, and that may be what the Solomon scale well, is about, right. saying if people stop looking for work, and well, right. go ahead. Sorry. Well, it's just interesting, because we go, as we go on in these slides, you're going to find yeah. out how they actually determine them, because they talk about people leaving the workforce or being too discouraged to work or something like that. I right. don't know any of these people. Right. You know, being unemployed for myself. And, and full disclosure, I will just, just, just to say, um, I'm also a musician, I'm a creative person, but so as a creative person, we always have what you call the straight job, <laughs> right. which is what you have to have if you're anyone who's a musician and anything like that. Um, so I've always had straight jobs. I became unemployed four years ago, okay. four years ago. And throughout my travels and dealing with other people, I have yet to find anyone who is truly 
discouraged and not looking for work. I don't know these people. I guess they do right. exist. I know I'm not on the rolls, you know, and I know that I send out, you know, 20 to 30 right. resumes a week, and to date I have sent out 11,000. Wow. Yeah. Which goes to another thing that we can think about with the, with the first video, which talks about age discrimination, too, because we do True. know that some of the things that happen when you, know, when you hit a certain age, like I said before, at, 40, at age of 47, mm -hmm. there's almost a 6% chance that you will ever be employed full-time again. That is scary. 47? I mean, you're too young for, um, for uh, Social Security, which is now going up, the age. Right. But you know, what are you going to do unless you're rich? You better have some friends. Right. Um, but let's go back to the um, let's go back to the uh, statistics. I say only get freakier. <laughs> so this is how the government determines. The the government conducts monthly sample survey called the current population survey to measure the extent of unemployment in the country. The CBS has been conducted in the United States every month since 1940. Remember, I said in 1948 is when it changed, right? right? And it began as a work project administration project, and that was to get people back to work, you know, for those of you who remember history. Yes. So that's, here we go. You know, we're putting people back to work back in the 40s, but we're also, because it's, what was going on in the 40s, if we right. remember, it was the recovery, right? And so well, one of the... And World War II. And World War II. <laughs> well, well, World War II was a, was a recovery, right? <laughs> exactly. But you know what I mean. Right. Um, it's post-war, and you have... Uh, it's, it's very important, all of a sudden, for us not to look unemployed. So as you said before, it became political, correct? Because it right. didn't look good. So next slide, please. Let's continue to see how they... So there are about 60,000 households in the sample for the survey. The CPS is conducted in the United States every month since 1940. Where it began, oh, I already said that. <laughs> every month, a quarter of the households in the samples are changed so that no household is interviewed more than four consecutive months, which, if, honestly, if, to me, it doesn't make any sense. If you were going to take a sample of unemployment, wouldn't you want to stay with the people who are unemployed and follow them? So the, right there, I don't understand this. You know, I'm not a statistician, statistician either, right. and I'm also not an economist, but... I think they do. You want to randomize it. And if you're looking at, if you're trying to make a picture of overall unemployment based on a statistical sample, right. then I think you do have to randomize right, it. Right, right, right. Otherwise, but if you're, like, if, I mean, and though it does speak to other issues, I right. mean, like you were just when you had the worker groups and different unemployment right. stats there, I'm sure, frankly, if you looked at different geographical regions right, and right. different cities and stuff like that, if you picked all your 60,000 people from those places where you knew unemployment was chronically high, then you would the overall unemployment right, rate right. would seem chronically high. Right. So I think just from a statistical standpoint, you have to keep moving right. it around, is my guess. You know, and also I would think that you'd want a control group too. Right. That's the only. I don't see a control no, group there. So, yeah. so it's, what do you think about that, Kelly? They need a control group. Right. <laughs> I mean, they do. I mean, when you I, when you hear this stuff, doesn't it sound crazy? It does. It sounds kind of rigged. Well, like they isn't play that, with the numbers. Well, sounds rigged. Sounds uh, rigged is another w name yeah. for politics. So let's yeah. go on a little bit further to see what the next, the next. You think you see that? <laughs> so every month, two hundred and twenty. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I can't even. I can't even say this one without laughing. So we have Census Bureau employees going out and sampling people, and these people are going to tell them about their job holding or job seeking or non-labor force status of the members of this household during the survey reference week. First of all, it's just like those people who used to have the, the Nielsen recording devices yeah. in their house. I don't know anyone. Uh, I don't know anyone. Uh, I don't know anyone who knows anyone. And I thinking a Census Bureau employee probably making $8 an hour, $7 an hour, I wonder how accurate that is. I'm sorry. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You would think when you can vote for American Idol and tally the votes in seconds, you're going to tell me we can't do a better way of finding out what the real unemployment rate is? That's an interesting question. Yes. And it's interesting, I mean, it's an interesting problem, though, too, in terms of getting people to report about these things. I mean, I'm just, I would wonder about the accuracy of oh, reporting absolutely. as well. Because there's going to be so there's going to be issues around right. letting people know whether you're unemployed or not, and so it seemed problematic. But at the same time, then it just starts raising this question to me. Well, I wonder, 
now I keep thinking, now I'm just thinking about why do we talk about unemployment specifically? It's supposed, you know, I mean, it's a, what is it really supposed to be an indication of? Like if there's high unemployment, what, what does that mean on some level? Because right. it means different things based on whether there's mm -hmm. a social safety net, whether or not we have unemployment benefits for people, whether un unemployed people just means they're falling out of the workforce and can never get back in right, it. Right, right. Um, it's, now you're just making, now Jenna, you're actually just making me think about the history of even talking about unemployment. And the other piece, I mean, here's what I wanted to say like about my own experience. Because mm -hmm. I had, during the course of my life, I'd been unemployed for different periods of time, like getting out of school, or I stopped out of school for a while and was unemployed. I'd have to, you know, do you take odd jobs, like driving super shuttle and stuff uh -huh. like that, or working temp was a lot of, that uh -huh. was always my safety, my go-to place. Can I do temp jobs? Um, which is a little odd, since I actually have a PhD, but I was, wow. well, it's in German studies, oh, so I couldn't. That, that sounds really applicable. <laughs> it was very applicable. <laughs> so I was having a hard time finding work with using the German thing. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I, I had been temping at one point at, at Fidelity, and it was funny, because I didn't, at the time, I wasn't skilled in the sense of I didn't know computer programs back then. I didn't know Excel or anything like that. I couldn't, so it ends up like being knowing alphabetical order becomes my marketable skill. Mm. <laughs> so I can, I can file things away and stuff like that, but it's a little, it, it was a little, felt a little ridiculous to me until I found something better. But I know my, one issue to me I think about is when you get, when you're first unemployed, I mean obviously your like, self-esteem takes a hit and then you have to start figuring out strategies, especially if it's not something you plan for. Right. Like if it kind of came, felt like it came out of nowhere then like, what do you do? Um, and for me, part of like, I mean, I felt like I ended up developing certain strategies. Um, and well, here's what I wanted to say. When we use the word employed or unemployed, right. it's a little weird. It is. Because these are, I mean, it puts us as human beings in a kind of, just as a resource. We're a human resource, as they say, and being employed is already something that's, you know, as Karl Marx would have said a long time ago, not that I'm saying everything he said was right, <laughs> but, um, but. Wasn't it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, well, let's get out those capital and discuss. But um, no, I, like I said, I studied German, but um, <laughs> no, I was thinking about it. it's It's a little alienating. Are you employed? Right. That's not something you're doing. It's always on someone else. Right, right. Someone employs right. you. You can't, I mean, they talk about people being self-employed, but that essentially means being out of work. Right, exactly. <laughs> as a kind of a code. And so you're either employed, that is someone's using you to accomplish something, or you're not. So I felt like, so one of the things is when you are employed, sometimes you can get sort of a false sense of security about right. what that means. And you become dependent, of course, on your employer, the one who's like kind of running you in a sense. Mm -hmm. and. I think one of the things that kind of was an important lesson for me when I, when I became unemployed was kind of learning to, trying to figure out strategies of taking control back. Right. And in a sense, and that's, you know, becoming a freelancer, you become self-employed. Right. And it gives you a kind of sense of freedom, it can anyway, and a sense of independence and a new sense of autonomy. Um, I mean, at best. At best, yeah. But, it can but, be alienating, and it right, can also right. be frustrating. Right. And I can not right, feel right. like it's working. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I know that feeling. You, right? I imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> Especially since there's no money. <laughs> yeah, right. The money and the right. food and shelter part right, right, right. can become complicated. Right. Right. So let's let's go on. What was the next uh, thing on the uh, on the? Here we go. Okay, alternate methods of calculation. So this is interesting because the International Labor Organization, which is, a, I think it's a GEO of, or part of the UN, maybe a subcommittee, you know, are unemployed people are those who are currently not working but are willing and able to work for pay, currently available to work, and have actively searched for work. And that would change that whole subset because, you know, right. if you're not getting unemployment, then you're not on, you're not being counted. You know, you're not, mm -hmm. you're, you're not in that list. And you're just, I don't, I don't see where you're counted. I, I just, I've looked. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm sure maybe there's someone somewhere in this 60,000 households whose life may sort of mimic what's going on, and maybe they said that, but I don't think so. Right. 
you know, and one of the things that I found out too when I was, you know, booking the show and, and trying to find guests is that a lot of people who have been unemployed for, you know, a while don't want to talk about it, right. you know. I mean, do you really want to talk about it? I'm fine with talking about it, but in the same time, no, I feel ashamed at the same time, which is what I think most people in this situation feel like. Right, right. Ashamed, I mean, embarrassed, true. humiliated. Like they did something wrong. Yep, exactly. Like it's your fault. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I don't, I forget which year of unemployment, I finally, I think it was probably the third year when it got ridiculous and I started seeing the statistics that I would never get a full time job again. And I remember that this saying to myself, this isn't personal. This is not, the last thing this is is personal. Up until that point, I thought it was. Like, what did I do? You know, did, did I really suck that bad? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, honestly, I mean, karmically speaking, as a Buddhist, I'm thinking, okay, I know I killed someone in my past right. life or something, or, or, or something. And you can make all of those things in your head, but the truth of the matter is, this, this is not personal. It is not, if it was personal, there wouldn't be so many people across the board from every social economic you know, a uh, group and age group, you know, that, that, are, that are counted here. It would be, you know, just old people or just black people. Or, but it's, you know, it's across the board. And um, you're right, Kelly. I mean, how, you know, and I mean, we are so fortunate in the Commonwealth, yep. I can't believe I'm saying this, of Massachusetts, <laughs> because we do have something called Mass Health. Yes. And as bad as the mental, and I don't want to knock mental health no. providers because the majority of them are very good and very dedicated, but social services is overloaded. Mm -hmm. The money and budgets have been cut. Yep. Are you going to say something, Kelly? Yep. I was going to say that the system is so broken and fractured, it's beyond repair. You might be right. I mean, they, we may have to like roll out a new model because yep. clearly, um, you know, it's not working well for, and it's not even, it's not working well for a, no. a little bit of people. I would say it's not working well for the majority of people. But it sounded like what you were going to say was one of the things that oh, yes. the healthcare <laughs> it has actually, it, there is a safety net yes. to a certain degree. There is a safety net if you are aware enough to find it yep. and you happen right. to be fortunate enough to find people who will tell you because okay. there is not, I don't care nope. what you say, any kind of local uh, listing of the services by state, no. by county, by federal government, or by private sector. It doesn't exist. Mm. And therein lies the biggest problem that if you are not proactive, right. you're going to get in trouble. And like I, like I was saying, you know, would our, um, would our, um, you know, health, you know, our healthcare system being with at least we have the ability to go to a clinic, you know, to talk to someone. You know, and I actually, you know, I did have private uh, therapists, and then I, when I my Cobra ran out, I had to go, you know, to some right. so, some agencies, and you know, I found that they weren't less qualified. It right. was just that you had to be more of a consumer, because when they see so many people, I mean, I think that in general, um, they themselves are overloaded by mm -hmm. this. You know, that they are having, you know. Uh, real issues, you know, with the concept of dealing with so many people. But let's go back to the, I think we have a couple more slides. The, okay. And here we go. So here's what I'm saying. Our unemployment number is political. Yeah. And there's a basic strategy. Unemployment rate equals unemployed workers divided by the to to total labor force. Wouldn't that be simple? Mm. And considering that, you know, you are, ba you, we are on camera, <laughs> you know, yep. how many times a day? We are categorized, we are tallied, our IP address is hit, and mm -hmm. everything, everything about us is categorized. Are you going to tell me it is not that simple to take the, table, the, the total labor force and divide and come up with a rate? Well, I think it's funny, though. It is, as you were showing before, though, it is complicated in the sense of, the, because what it kind of all hinges right, on, exactly. there are two things. It hinges on what is the labor force. Right. Who do you count? Like even when you said teenagers, that already got me thinking. So, do we count people from what? Can fifteen is well. I think the age is. I think the age that they use. I should have put that up there was sixteen. Okay. And it's basically that. So they're tight. This labor force is sixteen. Right. To sixty-five. Right. But then they throw in this other thing, which again, that's where I'm not. I'd be curious to talk to someone about how they calculate. You know, if someone's decided. You know, I'm, they're not going to be in the labor force, right. you know, because of they have children. They're going to try right, to stay right. home and, you know, man or woman and take care of the children. So they're choosing not to right, be right. or students. Right, I've exactly. chosen to be. I'm in school right, at right, this right. point, or maybe you're taking a break. 
I don't want to work <laughs> for six mm -hmm. months or something. I mean, so it becomes, I understand how yeah, it gets a little foggy, I but agree. that's what's kind of funny on the flip side of that is that they're always, there is this focus on the kind of decimal increments. Oh, well, it went from 7, .7 right, right. to 7.6, so that was good. But you're talking about fractions of a number that itself feels like a moving target. Right, it's, it, and it's true. Yeah. And, and the whole point of it is, is that these are numbers, but behind these numbers are mm -hmm. people. Yes. And the situations that people are, are getting themselves into are desperate, or, or, or finding themselves in, because yes. in, they're not getting themselves into it. It's just the way it's, you know, it's, it's, it's shaking out. And um, I guess that the thing that, you know, that really infuriates me so much is that, you know, honestly, you know, when you go to, when I, my, you, Kelly, you said you had a different experience, but I remember going down to um, food stamp office to try to get food stamps. I've never gotten food stamps to this day because it seems so selective. It doesn't seem like, you know, it doesn't seem like, you know, here's the parameter. I mean, I honestly, I had... Because I, of the criteria, it just no, isn't well defined? Because or? the people who work there aren't very, and I don't really, I don't know how to say this, but they don't seem to be very helpful. Okay. No. And um, did you have that experience, Kelly? Yes and no. I would say, yeah, they were helpful in identifying what we could get and mm -hmm. know in that at the same time, they didn't like answering questions if I had them. Mm-hmm. So what did so you you ended up not taking unemployment and not taking food stamps oh, we, either? I took the food. Oh, you find you yeah, I, food stamps. We did take food stamps. Okay. And did you find that process to be? I think it's a lot of a lot of red tape. Right. Too much paperwork. An application that's like 13 pages when it should be no more than three, maybe. Actually, really, really. So did you have? Did you ha just go once and were you? Yeah. And then they mail it. To, then they mail it to you after. I've been Every to the so I've been to the food stamps office three times, oh, <laughs> and I, I the last time I was there I got stymied on the question about my income, and they said um, uh, you need to prove proof of income, and I go how do you prove a negative, and that was the end of the discussion, right? Because I didn't know how to you know how do you when you're when you're on unemployment you can prove it by your unemployment you know yeah. the IRS right. can and the Department of Revenue obviously can check. Right. Which I'm surprised that the food stamp office can't check that information. I thought they could too. I mean, you would think it's on the same computer, mm -hmm. and you know, if you know, it's so it's crazy. But um, let me just take a break here right now, and I want to um, bring up a video that um, I shot. The executive director for Somerville uh, Coalition for the Homeless really wanted to join us here tonight, but he wasn't able. So I did a video and really talking about um, some of the. Uh, unique issues of homelessness that comes up with being unemployed. So let's watch that. We're doing a lot of work on food insecurity in Somerville, and we've used a research, it's a community-based research class from Tufts. And so one of our student interns went to the welfare department and applied for SNAPs, food stamps, mm -hmm. and they, you know, she had, because we knew what she needed to apply, she took all the documentation she needed with her. And they say, fine, you know, we'll call you if we need anything else. They never call. They, they're supposed to respond in X number of days, like a week or something, right? They never respond. So she calls them up and says, you know, where, where's my food stamps? And they're like, oh, well, we need this. And they strung around. She was a summer intern, 10 weeks, you know, smart, articulate, advocate, Never got them. Right, right. Kept on them. Never got them. Right. That was my my whole thing, and and then I was finally told that I needed a social worker. To not true. Okay. Not true. So as I was saying in the beginning, um, the whole long term unemployment is, isn't a new phenomenon. I mean, it's just coming into the fore now, I guess, because the economy is so bad. And also because people are beginning to realize how the unemployment numbers are actually, or I should say, not counted. Not, that's right. <laughs> so if you're off long enough, you don't get counted. Right, right. And so with you, as someone who's working with the homeless community, there really isn't much homeless prevention out there. For actually, a lot of our work now, you know, we started out in 1985 with a shelter okay. uh, for individual adults. And it was started by people in the community who noticed that there were people hanging out in Davis Square that they hadn't seen before. When the red line was extended out to Alewife in 1984, it allowed people who were homeless from Somerville, 
who'd have to go to Cambridge or go into Boston to get a shelter to come back to the community during the day. Mm -hmm. So they got together and they got the, it was a Methodist church up on College Avenue to let them open the city's first shelter for individuals. We opened a shelter for families the, in 1987. Uh, we took over the main food pantries in 1996. Uh, we've created, we have about 175 people, families and individuals in permanent housing now that we support. But what we realized was that we could never create enough housing mm. because it's so expensive to create housing yeah. for all the people who need it. So over the last eight years, we've really focused more on prevention. In 2010, we prevented 140 people from becoming homeless. In 2011, that number was up to 225. Last year, it was 387 people wow. we prevented from becoming homeless. One of the terrible things about this recession is that more people have fallen into deep poverty. You know, the, the federal poverty level for a family of four is just a little over $22,000 a year. But the deep poverty is defined as half of that, you know, poverty level. So imagine a family of four in Boston trying to survive on $11,000 a year. Not possible. It, but they do. What's amazing is they that do. so many people do. So there are 50 million people living in poverty. The number of people in deep poverty from 2008 until now has gone from 16 million to 25 million people. Mm -hmm. So 25 million people in deep poverty, family of four and $11,000 a year. Only about 3 million people experience homelessness over the course of a year. And only 15% of those are long-term homeless. It's A lot of it is people who are living in poverty, they have some kind of a crisis in their lives. You know, we all get into crisis, but most of us are fortunate to have family and friends mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help us, you know, when, when we get into a crisis. You know, if there's a common denominator, these are folks who, for whatever reason, they burn their bridges. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they ask too many times. Maybe there are problems. There's a lot of stress in living in poverty. So uh, a lot of our, our work is to keep people from falling into homelessness. It costs the state $36,000 a year to put a family in a homeless shelter. We can put them in one of our apartments with all the support that they need for less than $20,000 a year. Wow. But the average cost last year for us to prevent a family from becoming homeless was $1,045. So imagine wow. 36000 a little under 20000 a little over 1000 I mean, it's a no-brainer. The problem is... And we've been working on this for eight years now, and we've amassed almost a half a million dollars just mm -hmm. to do prevention work. As soon as we get this money in the door, it goes right out because the need coming in is so great. You know, and it's like you think about who comes to the Somerville Homeless Coalition. It used to be, you know, sort of your old, you know, idea of what a homeless person looks like. Right, right. That's not true anymore. You know, these are people who always had a job. They always had a place to live. And because this is a jobless recovery, I mean, if you want to call it a recovery, right. you know, the right. banks are doing fine, but right. poor people are not. Well, the banks got a bailout. Yeah, the banks are too big to fail, uh -huh. but unfortunately our government doesn't think right. what the cost, right. you know, is to people. And so where are you finding that most of these uh, long-term unemployed people are coming from? Are they coming from referral from social services, or are they finding you on their own? No, no you know, it's like when when you're struggling you know it's like it's survival mode right so right. people know where the resources are and i think that we have a reputation i mean we really are the safety net mm -hmm. you know we're feeding people we're housing people and hopefully we're preventing people from becoming homeless in the first place so where gets out i mean we do publicize a little bit we've had some uh, we i think we have six different funding streams for our prevention program some of them are more restrictive than others some of them are just for some rural residents Others, because they come from the federal government and one of them comes through the state because the state has such a terrible problem with homeless families. It's really focused on keeping people out of homelessness. Mm -hmm. So there are some restrictions, but, you know, we, we put flyers up. You know, it's like, hey, if you're having trouble paying your bills or paying your rent, you know, come and talk to us. So what is there anything that you would really suggest? Because there's, there's the, obviously the, the financial part of it. That is can be devastating, but it can also lead to mental, emotional problems too. Yeah. So if you're not stressed out already, right? Exactly. You know, it's like this kind of stress is terrible on right. anybody's psychic. I mean, I think we, we everybody should understand that now. Well, no one does. You know that really. <laughs> well, I do. I mean, I, I mean, you work in it. Well, <laughs> well yeah. I mean, I've got PTSD. So <laughs> oh yeah, <that's laughs> from Vietnam. True. You know, it's like if you look right, at common right. denominators, you know, veterans. 
you know, victims of domestic violence, but poverty, you know, I mean, to me, poverty is a political issue. Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't pretend that it's not. Right. So if, you know, we're going to have people living in poverty, I mean, this, what's sick about it to me is that it costs more to have people homeless mm -hmm. than it does to have them housed. You know, it costs more to have people in the emergency room or in jail than it does to give them what they need, which is a home. Right. So it's like, who are we kidding? But somehow, you know, we would rather spend all of this big bucks, you know, down the road instead of going upstream a little bit and right, trying to right. keep people housed. Do you turn away a lot of clients? or? Yeah, for two reasons, basically. One is that we won't give money to somebody who's not going to be able to sustain their, like their apartment. You know, we're not going to just put a Band-Aid on somebody. They're in a crisis today, but they're going to be in a crisis next month. So we want to work with people and we'll give them case management. We'll give them financial education. We'll do whatever we can to help them make long-term plans so that they can sustain their housing. Okay. But if they're not looking for that kind of support and they just want a quick fix, we're not going to give them money. The other thing is, is that, again, there's so much need coming in the door that we can't help everybody because we right. run out of funds. Right. So for someone who is, finds herself, you know, like me, <laughs> four years unemployed, you know, I have my own business so I can kind of put things together, but I'm well below the poverty line. But I don't seem to be able to get any help from any governmental agencies. And, you know, then it gets very frustrating. It is. Know? It's terrible. So, to me, I, I grew up with Hubert Humphrey in Minnesota. Right. Humphrey right. always talked about the responsibility of government was to right. help people who couldn't help themselves. Right. He always talked about the elderly, the disabled, and children. Right. And if you look at our society today, we've totally turned our backs on those folks. Mm -hmm. So, it's very frustrating when we've got people who are disabled and entitled to benefits and they go to the welfare department or they go to social security and those bureaucracies do all they can to keep people from accessing benefits that they're entitled to so we'll do things like get a lawyer and go with them you know we'll send advocates with them and it doesn't always work because they still put up as many barriers as they can but it's really important to push back on that i mean mm -hmm. to me that you know it's unconscionable that as a society we're not willing to take some responsibility to make sure everybody has got at least, right. you know, the basic necessities. I mean, can't we all agree that food and shelter are human rights, that everybody deserves at least enough? You know, it's like I'm not talking about, you know, getting to the 1% or the 2% right, right. or, or the 80%, but I'm talking about having enough to survive. Yep. I mean, Absolutely. to me, it's like common sense, but it's also like, you know, what have we lost as a society if we don't look out for each other? You know what? Hi, and I would like to thank uh, Mark at the homeless, Somerville Homeless Coalition for that uh, great package. So we're going to change it up here a little bit because we all know that unemployment and uh, the after ramifications of it can be a real downer. So let's talk about solutions. Here we are. You know, we've all been there. I know I'm there. You're there. You've been there. Um, you know, you no matter what is going on, you have to move forward. So, Kelly, what are some of the things that you, that you do to keep yourself positive? I just try to think good thoughts and mm -hmm. not get mad at my husband. <laughs> That's about <laughs> it, which isn't easy. Right, right, right. Because if you do have someone close to you like that, mm -hmm. you do tend to take it out on them and lash out sometimes. Right. And it's not, it's not fair to them. Mm -hmm. Did you go to any networking groups or you just had your family and friends? Yeah, just stayed close to home. But in general, do you feel that you have the emotional support? Yeah, I would say for the most part. If there's anything that you could, you know, bring into your life right now besides, you know, disability, you know, getting approved, yeah. which would probably make your life a whole heck of a lot yeah, better. It, it already what has. is it that you need? Just, just to be stable. We're at the point for the first time since we got married, that we're stable. Mm. We've been homeless almost two thirds of our marriage. Wow. Well, good for you guys for hanging tight. Yeah. And Mark, what about you? Your situation's a little bit. Oh, Matt. Uh, Matt, I There's called you Mark. Call I, me Mark. No, <laughs> Mark was the other guy. Sorry. <laughs> and Matt, what I'll what respond to almost anything. <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. We can take it there. Okay. But um, yeah, what I wanted to say was. Um, 
When I was un unemployed, I felt like there were a couple things that really helped me a lot. One, it sounds a little basic, but um, I mean, I did, my wife and I, we, I mean, it can cause so much stress in yes. a relationship. Luckily, my wife's very supportive, and she actually was working at the time. So we weren't, you know, so that helped. And But just on a personal level, I mean, like I said, it's like you have to try to be, rebuild up your self-esteem right, and, yeah. and kind of feel a sense of empowerment. In a sense, you're going to take control of things. Right. You're going to employ yourself. You're going to try to do this on your own. So. First of all, I think you got to just something simple like exercise, yep. like just getting exercise, getting out and moving. Frankly, uh -huh. it was kind of funny, like a um, long time ago I read, I remember some guy in the Phoenix had said, well, the basis of freedom is the idea of freedom of thought. And I absolutely disagree. I think it's freedom of movement. Uh, if you can, yeah. true freedom is on some level, you can go where you want to go. Uh, and so for me, like it was bike riding. So oh, if, I, yeah. if I rode my bike, I was like, well, I might not be employed, and I might be worried about money and what's going to happen next. But I can get my bike. I can go <laughs> wherever I want. I mean, within reason. You know, right. there are places you can't go. But um, so I found exercise was important. And that just it helps you build, you know, you realize I'm doing something for myself and making myself stronger. And now and I'm having a sense of freedom. I can go where I right. want to go. The other thing I thought was really critical and was what I think ultimately eventually led to me finding work again was just getting out of your house, kind of breaking a cycle, or right, right. just breaking a cycle of isolation. It's just going and being with other people. Now, as it turned out in my town, there were a lot of other people that got in, laid off. Or I mean, it was a big problem. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and, <laughs> right? and, um, and so just everyone getting together, kind of putting our heads together, talking about different opportunities or things that people were doing or ideas that they had or doing resume workshops. Let's look at each other's, what, what can we do? Do we have any connections? People right. would just say, well, look, this is what I'm looking for. And if you knew somebody, right, you could right. introduce right. them. Or right. just teaching other people at the time, social media, it was, I mean, it's four years ago. Right. It wasn't what it is today. Yep. And so like even a lot of people, like since I had been on Twitter, I could explain to people right. like what that was and how does Facebook work or LinkedIn yeah. especially, because that was also right. important. What do you think, Kelly? Link not big on the LinkedIn, Twitter, and <laughs> Facebook, yeah. Yeah, so, right. and that was important. I mean, again, and these are also communities, and there was a lot right, of, yeah. I mean, on, right. a ways to reach out to people and meet other people. So, right. I mean, really, that's where, ultimately, if you're going to get work, the way I see yeah, it, right. it's through these connections oh, yeah. and sure. knowing people. And the other thing that I have found to be incredibly helpful is volunteering. Oh, okay. Because okay. what I have found is that when I'm helping people who are in a situation that's a lot more dire than my own, I appreciate yes. what I have in my life so much, so much more, um, and it's also, it's, I think it's also helpful to give back even when you're struggling because you can't be always mm -hmm. focused on your own personal stuff all the time. But you know, the other thing too is that for me, even though I say this now, and I'm going to laugh when I say it, but there's a, a, a silver lining, ha 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 ha, in being unemployed. <laughs> And that is that I do get to return to my dream. I do get to return to the things I love. It's sort of like the workforce kicked me out, and now I'm going to do me, right. <laughs> you know? And for a lot of people, I think that, that if they could do that, you know, it could probably make a huge difference. Well, I think when you were saying, too, about, first of all, helping others, mm -hmm. it starts to give you a sense of what your own personal reserves are mm -hmm. and a sense of personal abundance. Like, because you can feel so torn down and you can see um, some losing things right. right and left, you realize that there's always something more that you have still, and that, that and oddly enough, that you express by actually giving away to right. others. But I also, what I was hearing in the dream part that you were just talking about, if you can also find a creative oh. like, or playful outlet, I mean, for me, I play music and stuff like that. I kept playing music <laughs> the whole time I was unemployoyed. It was like that never stops. Again, that's something right. you have control over. It's something you can do. And it feels good, to, again, to produce. And now it's, again, you're, all the fetters, like you were saying, you have to make the decision between your straight job and what you want to do. Well, now you don't have the straight job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you can just focus on right. you know, whatever it is it's, that you really want to do. It's true. And it's funny because you, and you also have to have a, a sense of humor. I mean, because if you take this so seriously, and if it's all about you, 
it's not going to go very many good places. You right. know what I mean? It's going to probably go someplace where you don't want it to go. Yeah. And I found this to be really important, especially when I would like, you know, I send out all these resumes, but when I had to actually go and apply, I was mm. down in Virginia Beach, so I had to end up moving with my mother, which, right. oh my God. You that know, happens. come on, that's a screenplay right there. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. In the Bible Belt. Yep. Uh -oh. <laughs> nice. But, uh, you know, but I went out and I said, I'm going to have to go look for a job, you know, no matter what. And I was, I saw a sign posted at a laundromat. And I, right when they were putting it out, I go, I'm going to get this job. I'm going to go get this job. Mm -hmm. I go in there, I give her the sign. I'm like, I want to apply for this position. The woman looks me dead in the eye and says, Do you have any experience? Now. I've been washing clothes since I was 10, and I didn't know how to say, you know what I mean? Right. So I had to laugh because, you know, right. I, you know, and a lot of it is, you know, how come I say it's nice? Yes, the elitist people, you know, as educated New England people, you know, a lot of times we look down on, you know, manual label jobs, you know. But uh, so it was both, um, what can I say, uh, humanizing oh, and hysterical. Yeah. Well, humbling, yeah. thank yeah. you. Yeah. It was also humanizing. humanizing. Yeah. It was both. Yeah. <laughs> But that's a little they do have experience but then but it's that does raise another an issue and I, I know we're going down the positive road but this also kind of goes back to what you're saying if you can think about things kind of systemically then it you can feel like okay it's not just me right it's not I mean it, and you know sometimes it is the person <laughs> but, well, sometimes it's, uh, I mean nobody's right. perfect and nobody's right. the time. and we're <laughs> nobody's nerfect right. as I like to say <laughs> but um, no but it's interesting because just last week in the New York Times, I was reading, and I was we were talking about this earlier, um, how you know we're at 7.88 percent real unemployment, 16 percent, or something like that, and this is a time when corporate profits are at their highest point since Absolutely. the 1950s, and personal, I mean, and also you know as a percentage of national income at their highest percentage, and personal incomes at its lowest point since like 1966 or something. And one of the reasons for this, as the New York Times said, was that was this unemployment. Because unemployment becomes a way where people can keep wages down, companies can keep wages down, and they can because they know they have leverage. It's a buyer's market, and they can say, well, you know, there's a lot of people out there and a lot of people with skills, and, you know, so you've kind of got to take a little less if you want to have the job, even while they're profits are high. Right. Now I understand from a business standpoint you want to make your profits high right. and that's you know I, I know how it works but it is an interesting point of this role what almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy like at a certain point from a political and a business like political economical standpoint a certain level of unemployment isn't just tolerable, it's actually desirable. Oh, absolutely. For, you know, for certain, not all businesses, I think, but certain businesses. And, and that's, so it, it's something that makes you just kind of to wonder when people right. talk about unemployment, they, they want to bring it down. I, first of all, I don't, I'm not, on the one hand, when I'm, and the flip side is, of course, when unemployment's lower, then more people have money, so more people are spending money, so then there's actually, the economy's thriving. And that was in the stats you showed earlier. Right. If you look back to the kind of 90s, right. when the in unemployment, and especially long-term unemployment, was really low, things were going better. Absolutely. They're going better for everybody. Everybody. Um, so, anyway, I don't know what my point was. <laughs> it was a great one. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, other than it's in, there's the, the dynamic of unemployment and the role it plays within this system right. is something that I think, A, people should think about so that they don't take it so personally, but something for people to wonder about from a political standpoint I mean, and what it's, to do next. And it is true because a lot of, unem I mean, un unemployment is inherent to capitalism, too. I mean, I mean that's to be well, quite honest. Well, employment is, too. Well, employment is, too. And I think, we, <laughs> I think you're right. I think we should talk more about employment and how to get the populace employed but employed in a way in which it actually betters their life. Ha, yeah. ha, ha, ha. You know. Well, no, but also, I mean, it's well, the standpoint of, are you employed? Right. Because people are do, asking you to do something right. and you're doing it for them. Right. Or are you doing things that are meaningful to you and that you want to do and that you're happy to accomplish. Right. And okay. you wouldn't even call it employment. I really want to thank you guys for being here. Thank we got to wrap up. See you next time. Right. And thank you guys for watching. Thanks.